Uh, the next step is to talk a little bit about the different phases of this revolution, this AI revolution. And I thought it was very insightful and I wanted to share it with you. Um, and they refer to this as the four AI revolutions. So in his book called AI Superpowers, Kai-Fu Lee explains that there are four main revolutions from AI. The first is the control of attention on the internet. So this is about influencing what you purchase, the political, I, your political ideology, uh, and ultimately influencing what kind of relationships you have. The second is the control of learning and working. And so this could influence how we do grading. I talked about AI proctoring, uh, influencing insurance, uh, also looking at freelance work and how that's going to impact jobs as a whole. And then the next is perception, AI perception. Uh, and then this is going to influence the surveillance industries, and it's going to blur the line between the digital and the physical, because now AI can start seeing into the world, they can start interacting with the world in a more meaningful way, which leads to the final phase, the fourth phase, uh, which he describes as automation. And so this is an AI that is making decisions in the physical, in the real physical world. Uh, and, and this is like the example would be uh, automated cars, like uh, autonomous cars. And so these are the, the phases that he describes. And I want to go into each one in a little bit more detail because I think they're, he has some new insights that I didn't know about. And I thought it might be interesting for you to, to be aware of them as well. Uh, so first, the first revolution, Lee feels that America is already ahead in terms of controlling attention on the internet and impacting how we learn and work. So much of the world already relies on Google for search. Facebook is dominant in social networking. And of course, we also see a huge amount of investments in freelance platforms like Upwork and Uber. Yet, China is not far behind in these areas. We already see how TikTok created a very smooth mobile experience for watching videos. Didi, uh, was able to beat Uber in China. And WeChat has moved beyond WhatsApp in mobile payments. And in the education front, uh, VIP Kid definitely provides online tutoring for over a half million students. So the volumes, the, the data, it, it's, it's phenomenal. It's huge there. Now, the second phase is another area where Kaifu Lee feels that America has a big advantage, the second revolution. Remember, this is about changing how we work and learn. So one of the big differences between uh, China and North America is the protection of intellectual property. So we have that in America. We don't really have that in China. And so as a result, Chinese companies have been very quick to copy the online services of American companies. And some were initially dismissed. They're like, oh, that's an, almost an exact replica of an original interface, say one from America. Yet it is this hyper competitive environment in China and this ability to quickly adapt to the needs of the Chinese market that made it so hard for American companies to succeed. Uh, consider Groupon. There were over 5,000 5, Groupon clones in China. They're all competing for the same group buying market. Uh, Groupon itself, like the original company, had such a hard time competing because by the time that they had arrived in China, there were so many alternative business models that had been tried and tested and were preferred over the original Groupon model. Um, in his book, uh, AI Superpowers, Kai Fu Li explains that eye tracking studies of search results found that Chinese internet users were spending a lot more time browsing all the different search results. So they wouldn't just like go and, and look at the first, like the first result and then click on it. No, no, no. <laughs> they, they would look and they would browse, like they look here, they look there, they look all over the page. And they, they were like, why, why are people doing that? Why is it so different? Uh, and they said that actually they, they preferred 
browsing these results similar to how you go to a mall just to go shopping and, and just to see what's out there rather than getting that like it's rather than going into one store and getting that one thing that you need and then and then leaving their behaviors were different and so what this caused is because they behave a little bit differently uh, from this hyper competitive market rose these battle hardened entrepreneurs that knew precisely what strategies would work on their local market, making it extremely difficult to compete, right? You could have even the best service out there, get better algorithms, doesn't matter because you haven't really tailored to their market. And those companies have not only created what you have, they've, they've really tailored to the needs of that market. And that's what makes it so hard to compete. And so over time, several like competitive giants uh, have arisen atop of this, this massive battlefield, this um, entrepreneurial battlefield. Uh, three of the top five unicorns, tech unicorns, come from China. So a unicorn is privately held over a billion dollars. Um, so it has to be not like not on the on the market. Um, and so those three are the Ant Group, which owns Alibaba, ByteDance, which owns TikTok, and Didi, which I talked about before, which does transportation services. So the interesting thing about this new world of AI is that actually the quality of a deep learning artificial intelligence is determined much more by the quantity of data than the expertise of its developers. So this is very different, right? It's not about who has the bigger brains, who has the better research, who has the better developers. No, it's about who has more data. And if you have more data, you have a better algorithm. It's, it's kind of, it doesn't matter how good your research is. And so, there are two resources that are most needed for really successful AI today, and they are computing power and data. And China has huge advantages in both of these areas. They have more mobile smartphone users than the US and Europe combined. And with systems like WeChat, uh, they have mobile payments that they conduct way more financial transactions with their phones than, than we do. Like, for example, well, what's holding America back? Well, I mean, they're credit card companies, right? Like, they don't want you to move to mo like all to mobile payments. That wouldn't be good for their business. So there's things like that prevent that from happening. Um, and so that's, that's huge in terms of the data that they have. These mobile companies now have way, way more data. Um, it's like, imagine all of the data of your credit card company now appearing in like WeChat. Like, how powerful would you be if you had that level of data? And how much more at a disadvantage would a, like say just WhatsApp be compared to, to WeChat if it doesn't have that data? Like that's the difference that we're talking about. Does that make sense? <laughs> so they also have an advantage in computing power because uh, they manufacture many of the consumer electronics like smartphones, laptops, and most importantly, graphics cards that speed up AI processing. Now, that's not to say, I just want to be clear, that's not to say that they're suddenly going to like trump uh, or beat uh, NVIDIA. Like, that, no, they're not going to do that, but they're really close to copying, right? And if you look at the graphics cards that they are, they do a lot of the manufacturing of it in, in China. So they're not that far off from producing AI compatible chips. And so I, would, I wouldn't uh, discount it too soon. Um, even if they just have to buy the chips, for, say from NVIDIA, they'll still be competitive. That it doesn't need to be better. It just needs to be like, I have access to it. Now, third, uh, when it, this is the third revolution. When it comes to AI perception, uh, the AI perception revolution, Lee pointed to the electronics manufacturing hub of Shenzhen and its ability to quickly generate new low cost products that are just so hard to compete against. Uh, the example he pointed to was the unicorn drone maker, DJI, and their ability to hold over half of the global drone market. But that's not the only example. I mean, Foxconn, um, the company that makes the most mobile phones, they own more than half of the world's supply of computer numerical control or CNC machines. Um, 
if you don't know what they are, they're just the things that take a block of aluminum and they like drill it until it becomes the shape of your iPhone. Um, and so they, they're way ahead in terms of the, the physical creation. And that's going to make it very difficult to compete because if you are in America and you're trying to create a, a similar product, it would take you months. You'd have to find all these manufacturers. You'd have to source things from many different areas versus in Shenzhen, you just walk across the street and it's like, oh, there it is. Put all those pieces together. I, it's really cheap. I don't have to pay for shipping. I can get everything I need. If I need some help, there's some somebody who can help me build it. You know, I, I have a prototype done and then now I can just go to each one of the manufacturers and I can say, can you build this for cheaper? Can you build this for cheaper? And so like within a month, I've, I've done my whole product iteration cycle for the time you know, it would take like potentially a year to do development elsewhere. And so that's a, a big, big difference in terms of the perception revolution because you know, creating the devices that perceive like a drone, for example, is a lot of work. There's a lot of prototyping involved and is not easy to do. So that's, that's a big, big difference. Uh, and then the fourth uh, revolution is when we like what starts as just perceiving the world, it doesn't take very long before that quickly moves towards that fourth AI revolution of acting on the real world. And we tend to think about uh, technology change, like just in terms of the technology, and but not from a society change example. So, uh, for example, the famous example is the Jetsons. They had an incredibly futuristic technology, voice control for writing out your letters. They had like ways of making food, robotic cleaning maids. And it was interesting, but they lived in this society that from our perspective today might seem very backwards. In fact, like this society of the Jetsons, uh, wives stayed at home. Um, and so it's kind of this telltale sign that when we consider technology, it is so important for us to consider the society. Where is the society going? And the society, where the society goes is more important than where the technology goes. Like it, it doesn't matter what AI really does. It's, it's about what people do with AI. And when people think about, oh, like how many jobs are going to be lost? I've seen, ah, oh, there's all these weird statistics, like some will say, oh, 50% of job tasks can be replaced. I'm like, yeah, but I mean, people will just do other tasks. Well, like 9% or 10% of the full job could be replaced. Well, that's not really what happens. So for example, um, autonomous cars uh, will probably have more impact than merely just replacing drivers like Uber drivers. Um, the example that I've seen in another book uh, that I've read called uh, Measure What Matters by John Dewar. Um, he's like one of the, uh, the, the first funders, I guess, of Google. Uh, he talked about Zoom, Z-U-M-E. Uh, it's a pizza startup that bakes the pizza using robots. Uh, and it can, in theory, bake that pizza on a truck uh, with the goal of getting you like a, a hot pizza delivery on your choice in less time. Um, and so that changes the whole nature of food delivery. Um, what happens if your ghost kitchen is no longer a ghost kitchen, it's a mobile ghost kitchen and like things are cooked along the way. Um, that's just a very different environment. That's just a very different world to live in. So something to consider. Um, I don't know if that'll happen. I mean, like what happens if you have an accident and you know, all your pizza and everything goes crazy or I don't know, like, I don't know what's really going to happen, but you have to consider the society impacts beyond just um, the technology. Uh, the good news is that it costs the same amount of money to hire a robot in America as it does to hire one in China. So we are seeing a move towards local manufacturing today. But the main problem is that it's not resulting in us hiring a lot more workers. Um, the famous example would be the Foxconn facility. There was this expectation that so many workers were going to be hired, but they didn't, they didn't need that. Like, why would I hire them? Like, it's like, it's so much cheaper to buy the, the automation, the robotics. 